you would please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning in verse 46. John writes, So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he had begun to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Signs and wonders are an integral part of the ministry of Jesus throughout the Gospels. And this is certainly true in the Gospel of John. As we've already seen, the first miracle that Jesus did was at a wedding in Cana. And there we saw that the miracles of Jesus validate his identity as the Messiah. They're ba- they bear witness to the truth of his message, and they give us a glimpse, just a glimpse, of his kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. But at the end of the Gospel of John, the apostle gives us another reason why he recorded these signs and wonders for us to hear. John tells us that he's written these signs and wonders so that we might believe. You see, there is nothing more essential to our lives as human beings than belief. Belief is how we live and how we operate, whether we know it or not. You see, our beliefs drive our actions. We make decisions every single day according to what we believe. It is primary through belief, not through observation, and not through data, that we answer life's most fundamental questions. Questions like, where did the universe come from? What is the meaning of human existence? What happens to us after we die? The only way that you can answer those questions is according to what you believe. In the Gospel of John, John tells us that it's by belief that we have life We have life according to the name of Jesus. But in our culture, our understanding of belief is completely backwards. We misunderstand what it means to believe. For those who are outside of the church, it is often assumed that belief only belongs to those who are religious. That belief is something that is only for those who are those strange, faithful Christian types. But you see, everybody believes something. An atheist even believes something. They believe that God does not exist. We all live according to what we believe. But those inside of the church, and if that describes you this morning, you're inside of a church, (laughs) and especially if you've grown up in church, You see, we also misunderstand belief. We often think of belief as simply that which we acknowledge, that if you acknowledge that God exists, 
or that which we agree to. If you agree with this set of propositions, then that what is what it means to have faith. But belief is so much more than that. The question for us this morning as we continue our series through the Gospel of John is what do you truly believe? It really is the question that John has been putting before us for four chapters with Nicodemus and Nathaniel and the woman at the well. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish and have eternal life. What does it mean to truly believe in Jesus? And what do we do when that belief is tested? Tested by our sin, tested by our sorrow, tested by our suffering, tested by disappointment and doubt. This morning we turn to the second sign, the second miracle that Jesus did in Cana. And more than the miracle itself, we will be confronted with two provocative statements that Jesus makes about belief. And in these two statements, we will see what it truly means to believe in him. The first is this. Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Look with me, John 4, verse 46 John the Apostle tells us that when Jesus came again to Cana and Galilee, he had made the water wine. Now John bookends this story with a reference to the first miracle, Jesus turning water to wine at a wedding in Cana. So here is Jesus. He's come once again to Cana. And John intentionally wants us to connect these two stories together. So if you were with us several weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' first miracle in the Gospel of John. And we saw that the miracles of Jesus are meant to be a window that point us to a much greater miracle, a much greater story of redemption. As C.S. Lewis put it, the miracles, in fact, are a retelling in small letters of the very same story, which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. In other words, Jesus performed miracles to reveal something about himself to show us who he is. And so at his first miracle, at a wedding in Cana, Jesus turned water to wine to show us that he is the faithful bridegroom who has come for a faithless bride. He turned water to wine to show us that salvation is found in him alone for our joy that he alone is the one who can cleanse us from our sins. So the question we must ask is as we come to this second sign in Cana, a second miracle, what is it that Jesus wants us to see? Is there something more than the miracle for us? John continues in verse 46, and he tells us, at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. This word official could be translated as royal officer. We're not told much about him. We're not even given his name. All we're told is that he has a son and that his son is ill. In fact, his son is dying. Now, this royal official has sometimes been connected and associated with the Roman centurion in the other gospels, that maybe this is the same story. Matthew 8 and Luke 7 tell the story of Jesus healing the servant of a Roman centurion. Some have wondered, well, is this John's version of that story? And while there are similarities here, there are some key differences. For starters, the story of the Roman centurion is about his servant. This is about a man's son. But more than that, there's a key difference and the specificity of those other stories. Matthew and Luke tell us of a Roman centurion, a Gentile soldier. And for Jesus to heal the servant of a Gentile soldier tells us something about the gospel for all nations, but that's not what Jesus wants to show us here. 
Now, specifically here in John, the language is a royal officer. That is an officer who's most likely part of King Herod's court, the king of the Jews. This man is most likely Jewish. And that matters because of what Jesus is going to say next. Continues verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had come down from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now the word asked here is much stronger in the Greek language. It's really the word begged. I want you to put yourself in this man's shoes. This man is a father, and his son is dying. There's nothing he can do for him. This man is desperate. Can you imagine how helpless he feels? And he's coming to Jesus and he's begging him. He's not asking. He's begging him to do something for his son. Now this is remarkable for at least two reasons. The first is this. Notice how desperate this man is. I wonder how often are we desperate to come to Jesus? Were you desperate as you came to church this morning? The truth is, all of us are desperate. We just don't like to admit it, do we? So we even come into a sanctuary like this with all of our own confidence in ourself that as long as we look the right way and say the right things, that we can get through life on our own. But the truth is, we are desperate just like this man. The question is, do we know our desperation? This man has been brought to the end of himself. He's helpless and desperate because of his son, and he's begging Jesus for help. But I think it's also remarkable because at this point in the Gospel of John, how is it this man knows that Jesus can do anything about it? We're just four chapters in. It already... The fame of Jesus has spread. He's heard of this man who turned water into wine. This man who gave water, living water, to a woman at a well and told her everything that she ever did. This man comes to Jesus and he begs him for help. I want you to listen to how Jesus responds. Verse 48, so Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now remember, John wants us to connect the dots between this story and the story of Jesus turning water to wine in Cana. And you remember in that story, Jesus' own mother comes to him and says they've run out of wine. And you remember what Jesus says back? Woman, what does that have to do with me? You can almost hear that same attitude in how Jesus responds to this desperate man. This man coming to Jesus. He's come all the way to Cana from Capernaum. It's a day's journey, almost 25 miles. He's come to Jesus. He's begging for help. And Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Why does Jesus say this? What you can't see in the English is one of my most favorite things about being a Texan and a Christian. You see, because you see the word you here, what you can't see is that in the Greek, it's plural both times. So a Texan version of the Bible might read this. Jesus said to him, unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all will not believe. Here's why that matters. Notice who he's talking. He's talking to this man. But he's not talking in singular, he's talking in plural. He's addressing this man in his desperation. He says, all of you, unless all of you see signs and wonders, then all of you will not believe. Who is he talking to? He's talking to his own people. He's talking to the Jews. You see, already we have seen this in the Gospel of John. You may not have noticed John 2, verse 18, after Jesus cleansed the temple, John tells us that the Jews said to Jesus, what sign do you show us for doing these things? In other words, 
What sign are you going to do to prove that you are able to cleanse the temple like this? Prove yourself, Jesus. Give us a sign. Later in the Gospel of John, John 6, verse 30, we're told that they said to him, that is, the Jews, after Jesus fed the 5,000, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Apostle Paul described this attitude in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. This royal official, even though he was desperate, he would not have come to Jesus for help if it were not for the signs that he had already performed. He's come to Jesus because of what Jesus can give him. He has not come to Jesus because he wants to see Jesus. And there's a big difference. He wants what Jesus can do. He doesn't necessarily want Jesus. And aren't you and I the exact same way? How often do we want the gifts rather than the giver? How often do we want the inheritance, but we don't want a relationship with the Father? How often do we want the kingdom, but we don't want to bow down before the king? How often do we want salvation, but we don't necessarily want the Savior? You see, we can never separate Jesus Christ from his benefits. We can't separate the salvation that he offers, forgiveness and life in his name from Jesus himself. As my former professor once put it, Jesus is the gospel. You can't separate Jesus from the gospel that he offers. Yet I think this is one of the most common misunderstandings that we have about belief that if we would just agree with a set of principles and propositions, then that is faith. You see, I think John is giving us this miracle to teach us what genuine belief really is. It's not trusting in a set of propositions alone. It's trusting in a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And when we reduce belief to nothing more than holding on to a set of propositions rather than Jesus, we turn the gospel into a transaction and we turn salvation into a commodity. Jesus performed signs to show us that he is who he says he is, but we can't stop short at the sign. Dutch theologian Herman Ridderboss put it this way, Jesus is more than the miracles he performs, more than the bread he distributes, more than the child he restores to its father. He himself is the miracle. Did you hear that? He is the miracle. And it is therefore also he himself, he imparts in his miracles the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, and the light of the world. Now listen to this, the faith he demands is therefore more than faith in miracles. It is faith in him as the gift of God come down from heaven. Jesus is more than the miracles he performed. Jesus is the miracle. And John is giving us this sign so that we could know what it means to truly believe in him. It's the second and final thing that Jesus says. He says, go, your son will live. Look with me at verse 49. The official says back to Jesus, sir, come down before my child dies. No, I love this. Because though he's rebuked in a way with this challenging statement about belief, he doesn't give up. He's persistent. He doesn't back down. He says, right back to Jesus out of desperation, sir, come down. My child is going to die. 
Now listen to what Jesus says next out of his grace and mercy, verse 50. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Now in the background, any Jew hearing this story would have immediately thought of Elijah healing the widow's son. 1 Kings 17 tells us that Elijah brings a child back to a widow, a child who is ill to the point of death. Sound familiar? And Elijah brings this child back to its mother, and Elijah says, see, your son lives. And the woman says to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. The woman believes that Elijah is a man of God because of the sign, because of the miracle, because he heals her son. In the same way, Jesus heals the son of this royal official. But there is a key difference. Jesus heals the son of this royal official not to prove that he is a man of God. No, Jesus heals the son of this royal official to show us that he is God himself. I want you to notice where Jesus is at this moment. He's in Cana with this son's father. Where's the boy? The boy's 25 miles away in Capernaum. Jesus doesn't even see the boy. He doesn't touch the boy. He doesn't lay hands on the boy. No, Jesus heals the boy with a word of his power. He's not bound by geography. He's not bound by physical touch. Jesus heals the boy with a word because he is God himself. That same word that was there at creation and spoke the universe into existence. That same word that John tells us took on flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, healed this boy. Why? To give us a glimpse, a foretaste of the kingdom to come. Later, John will be given a vision. In the book of Revelation, he will describe that kingdom as a city, New Jerusalem, where there's no more crying, no more pain, and no more death. Jesus healed this boy to give us a glimpse of the kingdom to come and to show us where life is found. And so from the very beginning of his gospel, John has been confronting us with a question what is it that you believe? And here, he's showing us what it means to truly believe. Notice what it says next, verse 50. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Just as Jesus did not need to see the boy in order to heal him, this man did not actually see the miracle take place. He was with Jesus. He couldn't see his son either. And so as Jesus said, go, your son will live, this man couldn't see his own child. All he could see was Jesus. And all he could do was to trust him at his word. What does it mean to truly believe in Jesus? It's to trust him. Do you trust Jesus. You see, if you acknowledge that Jesus exists, that's one thing. But James reminds us that even the demons believe in shudder. So that can't be the kind of belief that he's talking about. What does it mean to truly believe in him? It means to trust him. And you can only trust someone that you know. You can only trust someone that you see. You can only trust someone that you have a relationship with. It's the kind of faith that looks somebody else in the eyes and says, I believe what you are telling me. And I trust that what you are saying is true. All this man could see is Jesus. And we're told 
that he believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. The question is, do you have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that trusts Jesus at his word. Martin Luther described that kind of faith this way. This breaks my rule of long quotes, but it's too good to pass up. So I want you to bear with me as we come to a close this morning. This is from the preface to his commentary on the book of Romans. I want you to listen to how he describes genuine faith. First, he describes a shallow faith like this. He says, faith is not the human notion and dream that some people call faith. When they see that no improvement of life and no good works follow, they fall into the error of saying faith is not enough. One must do works in order to be righteous and to be saved. This is due to the fact that when they hear the gospel, they get busy and by their own powers create an idea in their heart which says, I believe, and they take this then to be a true faith. What is he saying? He's saying there's a kind of shallow faith, a faith that is not deep, a faith that's just in a set of propositions, a faith that says faith must not be enough, a kind of faith that assumes that it must just be elementary to believe in Jesus, and then we move on. And we go on trying to do it on our own and trying to earn the salvation that's already been given. Martin Luther says this kind of faith makes us think, oh, I must do something more. But he says that's not genuine faith. He goes on and says this, faith, however, is a divine work in us which changes us and makes us to be born anew of God. It kills the old Adam and makes us altogether different men in heart and spirit and mind and powers. It brings with us the Holy Spirit. It is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace so sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. It's the kind of faith that is deep, that is rooted, the kind of faith, not a proposition, but a person, the kind of faith that says, I will never graduate from this, because we never graduate from Jesus, the kind of faith that says, I trust you, and I will trust you to the end, in joy and in sorrow, the kind of faith that looks on the cross and says, I need this every single moment of every day kind of faith that never grows tired to hear that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. He laid his life down for you and for me, and on the third day he rose again so that all who trust in his name would have life. It's that kind of faith. It's the kind of faith we begin to see blossom in this man. So we're told as the story ends, this man believes And as the next day as he goes back and sees his son, he asks his servants, well, what time did he begin to get better? And they said the seventh hour, and he knew that was the exact moment when Jesus said, your son will live. And John ends this story telling us this is the second sign that Jesus did when he'd come for Judea to Galilee. He wants us to connect the dots, to see Jesus as a faithful bridegroom, the one who's come to offer life to all who trust in his name. The question for you and me is do you trust him? Do you trust Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life? Because no one comes to the Father except through him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, oh, would you increase our faith today and continue to grow it. Help us to never grow tired of the wonder of the gospel. And as we sing this final song and go from here, would you continue to grow our dependence and our belief and may it change us from the inside out as our faith leads to repentance and eternal life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing.